going to start off with a couple of songs. And there's going to be a couple of maybe unfamiliar songs this morning, but also a couple of songs that you will definitely know. Um, and it's really good this morning that we can um, sing a bit more freely. Um, so we're going to start off with a song called Not Consumed. Now, this is a song that um, I probably got to know a couple of weeks ago. Um, and it's one of those songs that's been going around in my head, round and round, and I've just been playing it on repeat. And so from the song, uh, there's a repeated phrase and it says, we are not consumed. So if you can't really follow the song, if you've never heard it before, there is that repeated phrase, we are not consumed. And I want to just take us to two um, passages from the Bible that, um, that I think are the inspiration behind the song. And I'm pretty certain they're the inspiration behind this song. So we're going to turn, first of all, to the Old Testament. We're going to go to Lamentations. And it's Lamentations chapter 3. And I'm going to start reading at verse 19. Lamentations chapter 3, verse 19. I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Powerful words, aren't they? And we'll go to, uh, again to a uh, second reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And um, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, this time turning to the New Testament, and it just echoes those thoughts um, that we've just read in Lamentations. So 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6 says, For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. And there's so many truths that we can hold to you this morning uh, in those verses. And just really, really thankful that we can be here once again, as David uh, was praying. We're really thankful that we can be together as a church just to worship God for what he's done. Remembering it's not us, it's him. The surpassing power is from God and not from us. And I don't know how your week's been, whether you've had... Uh, an easy week, a difficult week. Often when we come on Sunday, we don't know what's, what's happened in the week. We're not really sure. Uh, we haven't been with each other, so we don't know how it's been. But um, this morning, we can just testify that we are not consumed. And I hope that you can just join in uh, in this song. We're going to have this song first, and then there's a second song called Adoration. I'm going to just ask Mark if he'll play those two songs, one after the other. Thanks, Mark. We are not consumed. He may endure the night. We are not consumed. Great is your faithfulness. All my days I've seen no less. Well, he tries to take our minds, but we are not consumed. But love is light, he is not consumed. Great is your faithfulness. All my days I've seen no less. And I see you in the wilderness and in green fields. I see you with the broken heart. Buried by the cares 
So I'm just going to hand over to Trevor now, who's going to pray for us this morning. I know he's there. We've already seen him sitting in the sunshine. So thank you, Trevor. Thank you, Alice. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come together this morning as a fellowship to praise your name through song, to speak to you through our prayers, spoken and inwardly thought, and to learn more about you through the preaching of your word. 
We thank you for the scriptures and the reality that is revealed within, not only the grand designs of creation and history, not only the marvelous revelation of you becoming one of us and preparing a way of salvation and reconciliation, but the reality that is our daily lives, the daily lives of we who are described as jars of clay. The scriptures do not promise us a carefree existence, but show us that we can expect ups and downs in this life. And in limitations, the author has been sorely tested, as indeed many of us have been and are being. But if there is a cloud, there is a silver lining. Heavenly Father, how we praise and thank you that you are a gracious, loving and long-suffering God. Help us not to be influenced by the circumstances of our lives, but rather help us to keep the eyes of our heart on you, knowing that your plans and purposes are perfect. Thank you, Father, for your steadfast love towards all your children, which is new every morning. You are a faithful God. We thank you that your love and mercy, your grace and compassion, your strength and your peace are new every morning. Help us, we pray. Keep us, we pray, from the sin of unbelief and help us to trust in your unfailing promises. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Loving Father, Thank you for the light you have given us in the face of Jesus, our Saviour and Lord. It is only through his sufficient sacrifice that we have been so blessed. For without the shining light of the Spirit of Christ within, we might continue to wallow in the darkness of the world. May the light of your truth, love and compassion shine in us and reflect from us the glories of Jesus into those around us and into the world, so that your name may be glorified in all that we say and all that we do. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
So we've come to the part in our service where we are going to share communion together. So uh, if you are at home, do feel free, as usual, um, to join with us. Um, if you've got bread and a cup to just share with us this morning. But I'm going to hand over to Amaka. Amaka's going to lead us um, in communion. So I'll hand over to you, Amaka. Good morning, everybody. I hope everyone is well today. Um, today I'm going to talk about what to do while you're waiting for healing. Um, healing can take place in different ways. And sometimes God performs a miracle and instantly heals someone. And other times he heals them progressively over time. 
When looking at scripture and the many miracles Jesus performed, it's easy to think he always heals people in the same fashion. But on closer examination, we see that in many cases, he doesn't do the same thing twice. Regardless of the method, receivers consistently showed belief in his ability to heal and the willingness to release his power on their behalf. The same is true today. If you've prayed for something or you've prayed for healing and nothing is happening immediately, that doesn't mean your faith has faltered. It also doesn't mean that God is angry with you and wants you to suffer. It just means it's time to thank, to thank God and that you are taking him at his word and getting better one day after another. Remember that from God's perspective, you are already healed in Christ. Just because you haven't seen instant results doesn't mean your prayer wasn't answered. No matter what your situation, no matter what situation you find yourself in, it's always a good time to be thankful. You may be in the early stages of the of your healing process. Don't fall for Satan's tricks. He always wants you to focus on the symptoms and what appears unchanged. When in fact you can actually be spending time thanking God for the part of life that has gotten better for you. Make wise choices, take care of yourself and thank God that you that you are getting better, stronger and healthier every day. It says in Proverbs 4 verse 23, keep your heart with you or keep your heart with all vigilance for from it flows the springs of life. And it says in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 18, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Now, I would like everyone to just take a moment to close their eyes and to put forward all the things that they would like healing from Christ, whatever it is that you would like to be healed, so let us just take a moment and close our eyes and ask God to help us. And after that, just follow up with a short prayer to thank him for being healed already. So please, could everyone just close your eyes now? Amen. In 2 Corinthians, chapter 14 it says may the grace of the lord jesus christ and the love of god and the fellowship of the holy spirit be with you all amen Jesus loves me, this I know Jesus loves me 
Yeah, thank you very much to um, Amaka for just um, sharing with us. Um, and it's really good as we take communion just to remember that truth that we're healed already, but also um, just to acknowledge that there are things in our lives that maybe we're waiting for, waiting for God to act on. Maybe it is healing of the body or maybe it's healing in another way. Um, and so it's just really good to, to have that reminder this morning. Um, surely going to hand over to Harry. Harry's going to be speaking to us um, from 1 Corinthians. So we're just going to read that together um, just in preparation for what Harry's going to bring to us. So it's going to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And it's going to be uh, for, but from verses 12 to 27. So in the Church Bible, it's page 1150, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, starting at verse 12. If others have this right of support from you, shouldn't we have it all the more? But we did not use this right. On the contrary, we put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. Don't you know that those who serve in the temple get their food from the temple? and that those who serve at the altar share in what is offered on the altar. In the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. But I have not used any of these rights, and I'm not writing this in the hope that you will do such things for me, for I would rather die than allow anyone to deprive me of this boast. For when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast, since I am compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. If I preach voluntarily, I have a reward, if not voluntarily, I am simply discharging the trust committed to me. What then is my reward? Just this, that in preaching the gospel, I may offer it free of charge and so not make full use of my rights as a preacher of the gospel. Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law. So as to win those under the law, to those not having the law, I become not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. Do you not know that in a race all the runners, ra uh, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Okay, so I have been reminded this week just how exhilarating the first letter to the Corinthian church is. Now, getting to grips with the many tacks and folds is both an engaging challenge and an inspiring opportunity, I think, anyway. And I cherish um, the, the time that I've got this morning to kind of, on one hand, conclude our series this month um, on missions. Uh, Mark and David have been walking us through the book of Acts. Uh, I get the rare privilege of reflecting on 1 Corinthians chapter 9 with us to kind of round uh, the whole conversation around missions together. Now, 1 Corinthians 9 is famous, infamous even uh, in some circles because it has recently become a lightning road for conversations and arguments about the con contextualization of the gospel. I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means, I might save some. That is what the Apostle Paul, uh, Apostle Paul said to the Corinthians in chapter nine. And we're only, I believe anyway, <laughs> at scratching the surface of the ramifications of how deceptively straightforward the statement actually is deceptively straightforward. How can you and I contextualize the good news of God in our day and time? This is an important question for churches like ours, who, as we seek the Lord's help to revitalize his work, 
have to kind of, not kind of, but we have to wrestle with this question. However, and you might not be surprised by this, I have a deep seated suspicion about framing the conversation in terms of how much the church should adapt its message and its method to connect with the people around it. So I'm a bit dubious or even suspicious whenever we frame the conversation of contextualizing the gospel about the message and the methods. And I'm going to explain to you why, but very importantly, or right off the bat, I want to say that I believe that framing the conversation in that way does not do justice to Paul and the Corinthians on one hand, but also on the other, it simplifies a rather complex conversation meant to invite us to reflect a little more deeply about the gospel. And here's the word that you're going to need to watch out for and the discipline required to see what God is doing in the world. And the key word there is discipline. So in order to kind of uh, help us get going, um, those of us that are in the building, I have given you a sheet of paper. Um, it is a letter. I'm going to explain for everybody else who is online. And actually what I might do is, uh, I'm going to share that letter on screen so that you can read along with us. So I'm going to quickly read the letter with us. And that's because I've got a couple of questions for us uh, to answer because this is very important in the way that we're going to progress together this morning. Uh, where are we? Good. Right, so this is dated the 25th of July, 2021, which is today. And the reference um, is booking, and then there's a number there, right? And here's the letter, or at least this is what is written. Dear Miss Kilpatrick, thank you for considering the Highgate Hotel. We are glad that you consider us the venue of choice for conducting your business negotiations. We take great pride in the atmosphere of relaxed elegance to which you refer. I am pleased that you had the foresight to warn us about your unusual meetings. I'm afraid, however, that we cannot make exceptions to our basic dress code of casual formal for the meetings you have in mind. Dressing in costume would be disruptive to our other guests, no matter where you sat in the public dining area. Booking one of our private suits, however, would allow you to confine your appearance as George the Giant Frog to that private area. If this is something you're willing to consider, we would be glad to discuss the arrangements at your convenience. All of us at the Highgate Hotel wish you the best on all your business ventures and look forward to serving you in the future. Sincerely, Paula Millard. Stop sharing. Okay, great. Now, I've read that letter because reading 1 Corinthians or actually any of Paul's letters is much like reading other people's mail. And why that is important is actually it helps us define, number one, what, what posture we should take in understanding God's word, which I'm arguing we need to see, especially 1 Corinthians, as a letter not written to Raz initially anyway, but a letter written first to the Corinthians, and we are only eavesdropping into other people's mail. Now, that might sound obvious initially, but it's actually quite important because it actually helps us to ask the correct questions. Now, back to this letter about the Highgate Hotel. If you had to piece together the initial email or the initial letter that Ms. Kilpatrick wrote, 
to Paula. What would you say was the question and what other information would you include in the initial letter or email? It's not a rhetorical question, by the way. So, so, so if you're online, please unmute yourself, give an answer. If you're in the building, feel free to give an answer, but maybe for the sake of everybody who's online, feel free to speak a bit louder, uh, louder than you'd normally would. So the question is, I want you to think about the first letter, because this is clearly a response to a letter, right? So if you had to imagine the first letter written by Miss Kilpatrick to Paula, what, what questions would you have? And what other information would you include in it? Stick, great. So the, one of the questions is, well, so somebody wants to wear a costume, um, which has been conveniently basically framed as George the Giant Frog. Um, and obviously we've had a response. Great. What other question? Very good. So you're approaching it, Patricia, as from the, from the point of view of the event organizer. So what's going on? What do you want to do? That kind of thing. Uh, that's very important. Although initially, I just want you to picture the first letter that Miss Kilpatrick wrote. And what is she asking for? She's asking basically to wear a costume. Uh, what other information has been included in the first letter? Clearly, Ms. Kilpatrick has got an idea of the layout of the hotel and they are suggesting or they're specifically asking to, to, to have this special event or special celebration in a particular area. Right? Cool. I'm happy with that. What other information is in this response that you think actually was included? So forget about the question part. It is just I'm interested in your ability to to suss out other information. Fantastic. So we take great pride in the atmosphere of relaxed elegance to which you refer. Fantastic. What else? Fantastic. So they're wanting to conduct business negotiations. Uh, very interesting business negotiations, I should say. But hey ho, they, that's that, that's still the information that. Trevor. The date and the time, although it's not specific. Fantastic. So what exactly about the date and the time? Are, are you okay to elaborate? Well, she'll, she'll obviously have stated when she wants to have the meeting, won't she? Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, good. Good observations. Very good. So um, it's more than just saying, I want to wear X, Y, Z. Uh, basically, as Patricia has, has pointed out, there's a conversation or a negotiation happening here where Ms. Kilpatrick is asking the hotel to a, either relax the dress code or to consider allowing um, this group of people to do or to wear how they want to wear for this particular um, event. Great stuff. So I hope that actually helps you realize that obviously the way that we handle mail actually uh, forces us to ask obvious questions about the, co the, the correspondence and, and the conversations that are happening between two people groups. So in this case, we have got the Hager Hotel and Miss Kilpatrick. And like we've observed or actually clearly pointed out, we can piece the first letter relatively comfortably uh, we might not quote it word for word, but we, we can get to the initial questions, concerns, information, just on the basis of the response. Now, why that matters is the way that we approach 1 Corinthians chapter 9 is I want to see, in fact, the first letter to the Corinthians as a response to a set of questions that the church in Corinth have 
which Paul is responding to. Now, those are questions that maybe you and I might not have or might be interested in, but in order to extract value from God's word, we have to pause a little bit and kind of try to reconstruct what the questions are in 1 Corinthians. Now, specifically, if I can invite you to go back and look at chapter 9, what would you say is the crucial question or questions that Paul has been asked? Uh, Yeah. Very good. So Mark is saying that one of the questions that he's able to piece from 1 Corinthians 9 is this question of to what extent should apostles be supported by Christian communities in their endeavors to preach the gospel? Good. Any other questions that we might see piece out from 1 Corinthians? Yeah. Yeah. Great. So a variation to that would be, why have Paul and Barnabas not taken up the right, which obviously other apostles have, with regards to accepting and receiving support from a local church community? And what we have in 1 Corinthians 9 is, I should say, Paul's response to those particular two questions. So the first question If I can summarize what Mark was trying to say is, what freedoms and rights do apostles have regarding financial support? That's the first question. And underlying one to that is, why have Paul and Barnabas not taken up this right? And what we have then and what follows is Paul's response to that. Now, before we get to the heart of the argument that Paul raises uh, in chapter 9, I think I also need to quickly show you how Paul uses a style of argumentation um, to respond to the Corinthians in order for us to quickly then piece together what's actually happening in 1 Corinthians 9. So a typical argument works as a process that starts with something basic and then it builds up gradually, step by step, taking us to a logical conclusion. Would you agree? So something simple, build it, make your your conclusion. But one of the challenges of reading Paul is that more often than not, he lapses into a stereotypically Jewish mode of arguing, which is more like basically a side-by-side way of arguing um, rather than a step-by-step arguing. And what I mean by that is I'm going to quickly show you which is, and you don't need to turn to this, but it is still in 1 Corinthians, it is in chapter 6. So, for example, the first part of 1 Corinthians chapter 6 may seem similar to what we find in Ephesians chapter 1, 22, and the way it uses the analogy of Christ being the head and us Christians making up his body. And so we read the words, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? And at first glance, that fits with what we think the argument in Ephesians Ephesians actually is. Our bodies are parts of Christ, Paul says. But then at the end of the paragraph, you discover that Paul also says, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? And you go like, hang on a minute. Um, Sorry, that actually throws me off a little bit especially if you want to understand how the Trinity works and how God the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit actually function together and how can we be part of the body of Christ and then also be the temple of the Holy Spirit. This is exactly what I'm referring to. So Paul is not building as in logic step by step. He's using a set of parallel arguments whose only connection is the conclusion right so if step one our bodies are bits of christ but then steps two each each of them is a temple of the holy spirit what we learn is that we cannot assume a single step-by-step argument because paul is in fact using two short parallel arguments 
which come at the subject from different angles, but converge at the same conclusion. So between them, you need, and this is my advice this morning, between the parallel arguments, you need to mentally insert a phrase like, or, or, instead, or, think of it this way. So initially, Paul says, your bodies are members of Christ. That's one. Or, or, think of it this way. And then he also says, your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. Now that is not step by step, but a parallel way of arguing. Now, why that is important is, what are the freedoms and the rights? So in chapter nine, the same logic applies to the cluster of analogies Paul uses in verses seven and verse eight, whose initial conclusion is in verses 15 to 18, but then finally at the end of the chapter. So number one, Paul, Paul talks about soldiers. He asks a question, what soldiers fight for themselves, basically? And he's not building on that. The phrase that I wanted to insert in that is, or how do vine dressers work? Or have you considered shepherds and how shepherds work? Can you see what I mean? It is a parallel way of talking and a parallel way of arguing and to then help us he also adds in what I like to call a what about moment which then he he uses to quote Deuteronomy chapter 25 where he asks the question or rather he makes a statement do not muzzle an ox that is treading So coming back to the initial questions then that we've asked about 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Basically, what are the rights or the freedoms of an apostle? Paul agrees that apostles actually have got the right to receive funding. Yeah? The same way that a vine dresser or somebody who works with vines is allowed to eat of the fruit of the vine. And the same way in which shepherds can, are actually allowed to uh, draw milk or eat meat from the flock. Paul is saying, yeah, that is true. But why has he not done that? Why has Paul not insisted on that freedom and on that right? He goes on very quickly <laughs> to actually wrap his, uh, his, his argument by bringing in a few things that the Corinthians need to consider. And I'm inviting you to go back or rather to read the way that the chapter ends. And simply, I'm going to say, without rehashing what Paul says, that sharing or at least being an apostle, which actually is akin to being somebody who shares and brings the good news of God. Paul is saying that is the same or is akin to being an athlete. In what way, you might ask? What I believe Paul is saying to the Corinthians is that an apostle's motivations have to be trained towards strong commitment to people and not a perceived right or a perceived freedom. Now that is important because in this context, you need to remember that there is an associated blessing that comes, or at least what is perceived to be an associated blessing that an apostle receives from accepting such a gift. And Paul argues that his blessing is simply in the freedom 
to share the gospel and not the right or the freedom to accept the gift. Now, this is a subtle and nuanced approach, I think, to missions anyway, or at least to sharing the gospel. We can talk about our rights and freedoms as apostles all we like. However, what we learn from 1 Corinthians chapter 9 is that the best way to understand the motivations of those the Lord has called to share his good news requires assessing, it requires the community to assess that apostle's commitment to the people themselves that they have been called to serve. And Paul argues that this is the most difficult and challenging part, not just for the community, but also for the one who brings and shares the good news. And this is because actually having motivation or having good intention or having the right to or having the freedom to is, is good, but actually not good enough. Because as we learn from 1 Corinthians chapter 9, that motivations or rights or freedoms have to be forged within the fires of relationship. Relationships with actual people. And that is messy business. If you know anything about 1 Corinthians, you're going to know all of the issues that the Corinthian church actually has ranging from weird views about somebody sleeping with his own mother to singleness and what that looks like and everything else in between. And even before you get to 1 Corinthians chapter nine, you, you've already been sucked into this where Paul is at pains with this group of people, not because he thinks that his right or his freedom as an apostle is, is the thing that really quantifies his motivation, but it is his commitment to the people themselves. And like I'm saying, that is messy business. And so when you get to the part where Paul says, and this is where we began, <laughs> that I became, let me just properly quote it. Uh, I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means, I might save some. That's got nothing to do with a trick. Or uh, if you remember, basically my suspicion about how the conversation around contextualizing the, the gospel actually is, it is not about a method um, or a way of trying to talk about the gospel but actually, like we are saying, if you just read 1 Corinthians and you want to understand what Paul means by him becoming all things to all people, that has been forged within the fires of relationship. And that, I'm arguing this morning, is what Paul is arguing a good apostle looks like. Not just one who's got good motivations, but whose motivations have been trained, like an athlete, remember, within the fires of messy, contextual, and difficult relationship. Weird views, messy lives, and all of that in between. So Paul and Barnabas accept that the way they have modeled their relationship with the Corinthians is unorthodox to say the least, and that it may have problems in itself. However, they could not be faulted, A, in their preparation and also in their motivation for wanting to serve the church. And I'm arguing this morning that what Paul is saying is that that is a more, that is more valuable, that is a more valuable attribute of an apostle than what the perceived rights or freedoms that an apostle has. So if we want, we can judge soldiers, we can judge wine dressers and shepherds 
by their freedoms and rights, so by their freedoms to eat and by their freedoms to demand something from their labors, but perhaps a better way, and I think this is what Poe is saying, a better way to decide what, a, what an appropriate way of judging a good apostle is to examine how their motivations for sharing the gospel has got a subject. And that subject is the people for whom God or the God of this universe died. So I invite you to go to read 1 Corinthians chapter 9 again and examine for yourselves whether what I'm suggesting is right. But just remember, this is a letter, not to us, but to the Corinthian church. And you need to peace or you need to try to ask and find out what the key questions are. As you do that, remember that Paul, in the way that he argues, that not, does not argue in terms of step-by-step -step logic, he argues in parallel ways. And the key thing that we need to do in that instance is insert or, or instead of, or have you considered, and only understand that those analogies that he's using only actually ever converge at the conclusion. And 1 Corinthians chapter 9 concludes with Paul talking about training yourself as an athlete. What does that have to do with being an apostle? And my suggestion to you is simply this, that Paul uses that analogy to argue that having rights or freedoms or even motivations in itself is not good enough because those motivations have to be trained like an athlete trains themselves for a prize. And the way that, that you train your motivations and freedoms and your rights, only, especially when it comes to sharing the gospel, should be forged within the fires of, of relationship with God's subject, with people. And I'm, I'm also saying, if you, if, if you read 1 Corinthians, that is messy business. And now a question for us. Hi again. As we look to revitalize our work, as we look to partner God in calling this local community to the gospel, have we trained our motivations for sharing the gospel in the way that Paul is suggesting? And mind you, Paul is saying, you need to train like an athlete. And that, I'm saying, is only done through relationship. I've gone on a bit longer than I intended, but I hope that's been helpful to us. And that actually, if you take anything away from this afternoon, that maybe go back and read 1 Corinthians chapter 9 again. May God bless you. May he bless us all. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.